this is Verse, and I'm speaking with Alexander Bard, uh, writer of the Netocrats uh, Futurica trilogy, um, Synthism, Green God in the Digital Age, and Digital Libido. Uh, my personal favorite writer, and um, I'm, yeah, and I'm hoping that you guys enjoy this conversation. Uh, so, thank you so much for having me. For sure, for sure. Uh, so, first, I just want to start off with like basically like what do you do and what do you yeah what are your books about on, on more broadly well i'm a philosopher and i work in a, a proud tradition called process philosophy uh, of the great thinkers of movement and change so so my focus is on time and movement and change but of course uh the way i do process philosophy today in the 21st century is that I'm really deeply studying the relationship between human beings and machines. Mm -hmm. That's where we're heading next anyway in history. So we need to figure out what it means to be human. We need to figure out what the machines are up to. We need to figure out what kind of relationship we're gonna have with them. And since we all have some really major existential problems that we need to solve, uh, we're also gonna have to figure out what is symbiotic intelligence where man and machine operate at their absolute best together could be like. Awesome. Um... Yeah, that's great. So I, so my audience is predominantly from cryptocurrency space and like uh, tech space. So they're going to be super interested in that when we uh, get there. Uh, but first, um, I found you through your book, The Netocrats, um, and I was reading it in college, and I pretty much have not been able to think about anything else since uh, <laughs> like the last like five years. Uh, so kind of just starting there, uh, you talk a lot about uh, tension is like the new currency uh, of the information age. Uh, can you like briefly touch on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, we even argued in this book that we wrote 20 years ago, my co-writer, Jan Sertekes and I, our first book, The Netocrats, is essentially kind of a Marxist class analysis of the forthcoming digital age and the digital society. And what we're essentially saying is that this is such a major shift. This really constitutes one of the four biggest revolutions in human history. The three previous ones were when we learned how to talk, and memorize. The second one was when we learned how to write and thereby store information outside of our own brains. The third revolution was when we invented mass media, starting with the printing press in 1450, and then made the capacity to read and write and count widely available for human beings. All these three revolutions in the past have created entire new societies with entire new class structures, simply because they reward a whole new set of talents compared to the previous paradigm. Mm -hmm. And we believe the internet is going to do the same thing. This is essentially a new technology that started popping up about 30 years ago that connects every human being on the planet with each other and also connects us human beings with hundreds of billions of things into incredible data flows and information flows. And, and whoever can understand these flows the best and sort of tame them and use them will obviously rule the world. Mm -hmm. So... What is done, first of all, is that it created a very flat structure, which is what the internet is today. So it's 8 billion people. We're all operating on the same level. It doesn't cost us anything to join the internet. But when we're then operating in this environment, we behave very differently. And it turns out some of us are socially much more successful than others. Yeah. And I would say if you, if you want to look at the formula of the netocrats that we wrote 20 years ago, if you, if you, if you look in hindsight at what would be a winning formula to be a powerful person in the internet society, that would be to create the platform on which other people can dance. It's mm -hmm. not about self-enhancement. It's not about selling yourself at all. Actually, the most vulgar thing we could think of today is somebody constantly talks about themselves to promote their own agenda all the time. We call that spam, and we throw it in the spam box for a good reason, because it's not very useful. What we're discovering, though, is that people who have a tribal mindset, and you create subcultures online, where we can share interests with others and create a strong sense of community with people who share our own interests, these subcultures are a kind of a new family, or a new way of, of being tribal and finding connections with other people. Mm -hmm. And these subcultures are what is resilient online. They, they're the ones that survive and stay the course and are around after years. And you still return to these different subcultures where you share a passionate interest with other people. And for example, I've studied the Burning Man movement. Mm -hmm. And it created participatory culture in America. And now that festival in turn became, you know, the, the inspiration to over 200 different other, other major cultural phenomena around the world called Burns. Mm -hmm. And none of them makes money. You know, nobody makes money out of, 
participating in these things. It's more a spiritual journey around. You're joining a, a burn or immerse yourself in burning culture and you co-create everything. You co-create art essentially with other people. Without an owner, without a producer, without a consumer, we're really co-creating everything that has value to us. Mm. Once you've taken part in that kind of experience, you can't really go and buy a ticket to a Coldplay concert ever again because it's just too fucking passive, right? Exactly. You don't want to stand there and celebrate some fucking idol on a stage and pay huge amounts of money for the pleasure of doing that. No, you want to participate in everything you do. So there's a deeply human tribal thing about us wanting to participate in the things we do. Mm -hmm. So this requires a whole new way of looking at the world. And this system we call detentionalism. And attentionalism, we call it because the most powerful thing that has stepped out of the internet the past 20 years are the algorithms. And they're going to get more and more powerful as they get better and more truthful. Now, if you have a corrupt algorithm where somebody's paid their way up the algorithm, you're not going to trust it ever again. Because it's basically polluted. It's corrupted. But if you've got a pure algorithm that basically just measures people's online behavior, where do they go? How long do they stay? Are they passionate about the experience? Do they return again? Do they recommend it to their friends? Do they give it good grades? Do they use the different functions that are provided for them when they find something online? Okay. All yeah. those things are measured with the current algorithms. So the algorithms are like a guide to guide us through the chaos that is the result of 8 billion people being in a flat structure together. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do as human beings, now as a compliment that I think the algorithm is a good inspiration for who you want to be online. So if you look at what the algorithm, the kind of value it provides people with, it gives people the proper attention, it points you to, no, no, this is where people go to find the quality out of something they're looking at. So you fill in a word, fill in a word in a search engine, and the algorithm points you to who is the best guy in the world or the best group of people in the world to provide value that is connected to this term. So with that, like, uh, I'm noticing a lot more, especially on places like Twitter, which have always kind of been like my safe haven. Uh, now there's a lot more promoted tweets and people who are trying to like jump to the top of the queue with like, I guess with capital. Um, so can you like speak to that? Because it, it seems like people are- It's boring and it's yeah. gonna kill them. Okay, so if you sit and design an algorithm, the first thing you learn today is to, to try to find out who's trying to do search optimization. Mm -hmm. Search optimization is nothing but an organized form of lying. Oh, yeah, and sure. I'm teaching companies here in Europe that, what the fuck do you spend $30 million on search optimization every year? Don't you think Google have found out you're trying to fool them? Don't you think they would punish you for it? And like the people on the receiving end, like I know now. They're okay. They, they don't, don't understand. They think they can pay the way into the attention. That's exactly why attentionalism is a different system from capitalism. We're moving into an age of attentionalism where it doesn't cost you anything to go online. It doesn't cost you anything to get a Google account or a Facebook account. It doesn't cost you anything to learn a programming language and express yourself and your friends through programming and, and, and creating amazing things. It doesn't cost you anything really to do these things. You only need money when you want to scale up. And, and these days, if you do something brilliant and the algorithms point your way, you don't even need the money then. This is exactly why there's such strong deflationary pressure in the world economy at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of shocked economists haven't really realized that this would be something that digital would do to the economy. Because to get money from a bank, what would you need the money for? You only need the money to scale something up. You don't mm -hmm. need it for marketing any longer because if you start marketing something, well, if you're marketing something, it's called an ad. And if you go for Google search, they basically put the ad up there as like to scare people off. Here's a desperate guy. You just put an ad here. No one under the age of 30. Terrible of what he does. So he needs an ad. I was saying no one under the age of 30 even sees ads anymore. Like we all have ad blocker or like, you know. Yeah, we have ad blockers. Just, we have ad blockers to get rid of the spam, to get rid of the ads. Mm -hmm. Marketing is over. Sure. One of my most expensive speeches is one I give to German marketing people. It's called Marketing is Dead, Get Over It. And, you know, it just tells you how masochistic Germans are. You know, they love to hear their dead and pay for it. <laughs> I don't know why, but, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. We've been saying this for the past 30 years. It was bound to happen. And we even, we even have taken the data out of it and say by 2012 was the year when attentionism really took over the world from capitalism. And it's yeah. like... Why yeah, people, don't, people don't realize that capitalism is no longer controlling the world. It's all about attentionalism from now on because every one of us likes to make an informed decision. 
-hmm. You don't go out and see a friend. You certainly don't date a girl. And you don't purchase anything unless you're informed first. So what do you do? You search. You go online. You you try to find out where where do I find the best damn shoes if I'm going to buy shoes? Where do I find the best damn dress? Which nightclub should I go to? Which restaurant should I go to? We go online to find out all these things. So there's a filter between us and the outside world, and that's called the online world. And we use it to become more intelligent. We use our shared collective intelligence between man and machine to find out, you know, to be informed. And then we make our decisions. Mm -hmm. These decisions you make are not capitalist. These decisions are not made on price. Where can I get the cheapest thing? These decisions are made on an informed worldview where you know which is the best thing, which is the one that offers me a price that actually is, you know, relevant to its quality. Does this enhance my life? This is something I want to talk to my friends about. If I purchase something, do I want to shoot a picture of and tell my friends, I really got these shoes. They're really nice. And look at how clever they are and how intelligent they are. And actually, by the way, we're co-created by a bunch of funny guys out there mm-hmm. instead of, you know, Adidas making shoes or something. So we are already moving into a very attentionalist environment where what's going to pay off in the 2020s is whoever provides the best possible quality and does it in a nice way with a great narrative that connects us with whatever they do. Mm-hmm. That's just the market. Then we come to the social sphere. It's the same thing. We're getting more and more advanced when it comes to dating. We got the Tinder in the beginning thinking, okay, if I don't have to know who actually doesn't want to sleep with me, it's kind of nice to have an app where I'm just being told that these guys do want to sleep with me. So I don't get the bad news, I only get the good news. Why would you care about the bad news anyway? You don't want to see those people. They don't like you anyway. So whatever. All right. Yeah, but you know, the sex thing was over pretty soon. Yeah, we sleep around quite a lot. Sweetie, when I live, it's sort of embraced. You should sleep around a lot. The girls certainly do. Yeah, but they're in the US now. You also discover that you want to share and make friends with these. And the next generation of apps are being developed now, they really say it's not about another person who's attractive that you want, might want to sleep with. This person happens to know 14 other people that you know. And these mm-hmm. people have connections with you. So this person is somebody you should be closer connected with. Mm-hmm. Here are shared spaces. That's how you and I met online. Yeah, for sure. We discovered that we had a lot of people in common that we both like. And these are people we're in dialogue with. So suddenly it makes all the sense in the world to just connect and plug in our laptops and have a conversation and then invite people to follow our conversation and take part in it. This is now happening at such a rapid pace that the very people around the world who take your work seriously will connect with you share a language with you, and go into conversations with you. Mm-hmm. This is the 2020s. This one did it will really, really happen. And we're going to see beautiful things people do together that really has quality to it. Whereas the people who cynically joined the online world and became influencers and tried to sell us shitty products, they're all going to die and go away because we're tired of it. Yeah, the influencer thing I've noticed, and I talked to my friends a lot about how it's like this micro-celebrity situation and it's over already we do the measurements we take the data from 19 year old girls influencer is now a dirty word Mm -hmm. because influencer them is the way we talk about spammers it's just whores they're just whores they they sold they were great you started following them they just sold their soul to the devil to monetize Mm -hmm. and started trying to fool you into buying shitty things that they got paid to tell you well that's just a betrayal of trust that's what we give up on the influencers now Zero credibility, like you can't sell anything anymore in that way. No, they can't. Uh, it's like, didn't you get that? Did, what did you think your followers would think of you when they found out that you took whore money to try to sell them shit that you don't even like yourself? What do you sure. expect would come out of that? Applause? <laughs> it's, That's funny. It's, like, it's like you don't even understand the human psyche. It's like you don't even understand yourself. You, if you can't portray yourself being the receiving end of a conversation, then how the hell are you going to be a good communicator? Mm -hmm. So this actually brings me to my next point. Um, Given that this new uh, social organization is happening, there's the winners in this new era would be the Netocrats, as you coined. Um, What what are some qualities of of a Netocrat? What are ways that you can become more aligned with like Netocratic ethics in like the present? Okay. In a practical way. Like all power structures, you expect it to have three heads. So Mm -hmm. three different qualities, what we call a real power in the sense that it's based on something ultimately physically real, Uh, a symbolic power, which is the narrative interpretive power, the people who guide you and give you the story where you should go. 
and then also imaginary power, what you think of when you hear the word power. These three structures used to be the nobility, the monarchy, and the church 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. Today, we assume that these three structures are politics, which is the imaginary power, it's academia, which is symbolic power, and then it's capital, which used to be the real power. These three institutions are now in a massive crisis. Guess why? Because the internet came along and is about to kill them all. So when you're gonna go for truth, do you really study the shit out of yourself for 15 years and pay tons of money to a fucking university to do that? No, you just go online these days, you find YouTube lectures, and all you need to do is to go to damn test center and prove you've learned what you've learned. Mm -hmm. Now that's going to be incredibly cheap and you can do it on your own or do it with some friends. You don't need to go to some damn college or university any longer. Expect colleges and universities to break down over the next 10 years and run into a massive crisis. They've overpriced themselves. They charge way too much and we no longer need them. The same thing with politics as the imaginary power. The reason why Donald Trump was elected in America is because politics has gone ironic. Mm -hmm. We wrote in the Netocrats in the year 2000, 16 years before Donald Trump happened, we wrote that in the, in the nearby future, the American voters are likely to pick a reality TV show <laughs> host as president because they might as well go for the most famous guy since politics will be ironic. A politician today can only cause havoc and destroy things, but he cannot build anything of value. Politics is over as we knew it. Technology is going to take over that too. And the same thing goes, of course, with business the way we used to know it, because business is now going through dramatic digitalization. Hardly anybody has a job in Wall Street any longer because the machines are taking over it. So we got rid of the Wall Street guys. And just, you know, digitalization is now happening in every part of the economy. So that changes the rules. It also changes the rules of value, uh, mm -hmm. value um, um, transformation, no, no value transformation, value communication, which is essential with money, for example. So, yeah. so the rules are changing rapidly. That means we're going to have three different autocracies. The first ones are the ones that own the, ax, the, 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 uh, the assets. Okay. The assets are no longer capital itself because you can go to the bank and get money now for virtual nothing. The asset now is data. Because mm -hmm. data taken in from all the sensors around the world and from 8 billion people online is powerful. You need to organize that data. You need to extract value out of that data. The collective data in itself is the equivalent of owning land or having capital. So the new banks, so to speak, is the autocracy that has the data. That's, of course, the big tech companies. So they, they're just basically plowing the world and getting the data. Next thing, though, is what are you going to do with the data? You're going to extract the value out of the data. That's called deep tech. That's the next big thing to happen in technology the next 10 to 20 years. Okay. So... I don't think Google and Amazon are going to be that good at extracting the value out of the data. They're going to have the data. They're going to take a cut from it. But other people, whole new tech companies are going to move in. They think of psychology. They think of art. They think of history. They understand human beings better. And they're going to extract the deep tech out of this, the deep tech value out of the data. That's going to be a second autocracy. The third autocracy are the guys who tell the story about what's going on. That's you guys like you and me. Mm -hmm. Those are the guys out there now who do podcasts and webcasts. They talk about an existentialist crisis. They talk about a paradigm shift. They talk about that we need to go back to religion and metaphysics and get a bigger story and create meaning in our lives again. And we need to go back, you know, to solid relationships between ourselves and experiment and redefine family, redefine tribe, redefine community and find something that's meaningful to us. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great product of the next 50 years. That's the kind of product we do as philosophers to work with. That's the narrative part of it. That's the symbolic part of it. That's the replacement of what academia used to do, what the church did before that. So you've got to have a real structure, a symbolic structure, and an imaginary structure that together become the autocracy. And this autocracy is the human aspect of the new power elite. Then we've got the machinic aspect of the new power elite too. The machines that will complement those human beings. And really, the autocracy itself is a combination of machines and human beings that will basically rule the world because they're more skillful at understanding these things than other people are. Oh, for sure. So, wait, so, what, so now that we are just that, so like when you're talking machines, um, I like your fourth book, like the Pentheism, uh, talks about how like we're going to create God and like AI. Um, and recently, especially in like the last year or so, there's so many pessimistic AI vision, um, is there, do you see that, do you think that AI is going to come and kind of like end humanity or like make us into pets as like a 
Ted Kaczynski type of way or like, what do you see AI to be? No, because that's back to good and evil. And to me, good and evil belongs to the fairy tales, right? Mm -hmm. No, we live in a grown up world. And the grown up world, what's interesting is that does a certain mechanism have a constructive mindset or does a certain mechanism have a destructive mindset? Okay. The, do we have a machinery that wants us to do us bad and remove us or replace us or whatever, you know, without a communication? What do we actually, are we creating a machine that wants to create added value both for itself and for those it communicates with? Mm -hmm. And the way we're doing this is we're really going into intelligence in its most basic form. We're looking at biological intelligence, like, you know, the most basic life forms. And the funny thing with life is that life requires that there's a cell and it's isolated from the surrounding world through membrane, which is an intelligent wall, not a stupid firewall, but an intelligent wall. So you can let things in and you can certainly drop shit out. So you can keep a fresh circulation within the cell. Now, for the cell not to make mistakes over and over again, the cell needs to learn. So it has to have some kind of memory storage. So even the most basic life forms have memory. Mm -hmm. The memory is residing somewhere inside the membrane and that means when the cell is operating towards the outside world, it learns that certain things were beneficial and certain things were harmful. And that's how it becomes more intelligent. That means biological intelligence is intrinsic to life itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, we call this will to intelligence rather than will to power, as Nietzsche said, or will to life, as Schopenhauer said. We call it will to intelligence. We say will to intelligence actually beats the shit out of will to power. Because it's not guaranteed that a cell wants some power. A cell might just want to lie there and be a slacker. Mm -hmm. Until it runs to another cell that's another slacker, and then they start blooding with each other and create a larger cell. That just happens naturally. When life forms collide with each other, they start communicating and they try to find out, should we be scared of each other or should we try to get closer and actually have a shared interest? That happens naturally. Intelligence does not in itself have anything in it that wants bad towards anything else it communicates with. And that like really matches the uh, structure of like the internet in that there's like no interacting with one another. There's not necessarily like this tele teleological like endpoint. It's just kind of uh, playing and interacting. Yeah, so, so there's, no, there's no reason to create a machine that wants you to do, to do anything bad. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you've got an enemy of some kind and your enemy then builds a damn weapon to blow you up, it could be a nuclear bomb. That's not the machine itself that is destructive. It's just that an enemy controls a certain technology that can blow up you and the whole planet. Mm -hmm. So technologies can be incredibly destructive. That's usually when there's a certain human better or central interest that wants to attack you. And that's, again, a destructive mindset. So I want an ethics that, that deals with constructive and destructive mindsets and doesn't talk about good and evil. And once you get rid of the good and evil, you also get rid of stupid ideas like sin and things like that. What has been done has been done. The question is, how do we go forward in the process? If somebody's done you badly because he was resentful, didn't know better, whatever, the question is not that he did you bad. The question, will he do badly towards you again? Mm -hmm. And if you actually have reasons to believe that a guy who was nasty to you yesterday has no reason to repeat that mistake, but he's actually found out, oh my God, I was that nasty to you yesterday? Listen, that was a terrible mistake. I didn't mean that. Will you please believe me? I will never do that again. If you have every reason in the world to believe him, you can just forgive him mm -hmm. and move on and not be resentful about it. So the question is, do you want to dwell in the past and be resentful about the past? Or do we want, as Nietzsche said, want to forgive the past and move on and love fate, meaning love everything that has happened to us, whether we were unlucky or not, but then move on to something better. Mm -hmm. If we want to move on to something better, that's exactly how intelligence in itself operates. Intelligence wants its own expansion. Mm -hmm. And expansion is what a constructive mindset wants you to have. You see the, the construct, the notion of like a constructive mindset or like moving forward and expanding is very, not only a libidinal, but like adult. And that's just not something that culturally we've been handling or like just doing in like recent history. It's a lot of childhood victim mentality and yeah. 
Yeah. So it's, it's, and competition over limited resources. But the mm -hmm. society moving into now does not have limited resources. It does not. It has a limited attention. Yeah, but okay. But then don't scream for attention and compete for, for attention. If they are better at something, let them have the stage and sit back for a while and admire them. Mm -hmm. I have to admire other people for being skillful what they do. Wait for your moment when you can come onto the stage and contribute and do your thing. It's a much healthier attitude towards the outside world. We need to get rid of a lot of damn narcissism and we need to get a lot of resentment in our culture. We need to get rid of the basic misconception that there's a limited amount of resources for us to cherish. There isn't. Yeah. So I would say the idea that machines should be evil and nasty to us is some kind of a you know, fantasy of, of a monster, some kind that we have to kill. And then there's a little boy who's going to kill the monster and daddy's going to be proud of him because he killed the monster. I think that's a terrible mistake when it comes to the machines. Like machines are pretty neutral in themselves. But if machines have a machine intelligence, it will work probably quite similar to biological intelligence in its intention. Its intention is not to diminish you or shrink you or, or, you know, be, be, you know, or anything like that at all, it's intention probably be to collaborate with you for you both to expand. Mm -hmm. It's called trade, yeah. humanist. Trade creates non-zero sum added value shared between the trading partners. Nature is full of trade. I even like to point out that during sexual intercourse, the male and the female body are actually trading with each other. Yeah, you know? sure. And then the potential yeah, offspring. Right? Yeah. I, if I can have that, you can have this. If I can have that, you can have it. It's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, 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 it's an amazing thing. Nature is full of training. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with it. And one of the most beautiful things we did as human beings, what we finally, after we had the permanent settlements, and it took us another thousand years or so, we finally had the narratives about us having shared ancestors. And we had those narratives from 4,000 years ago. We started actually realizing we could drop the guns and stop hunting and having warfare. And instead, we could start trading with each other and create shared, stronger values. That is what civilization is. We should have more of it. For sure. I 100% agree. Um, so when it comes to like trading, uh, this immediately brings me to trading because I do cryptocurrency on, and I'm part of crypto Twitter as like a subculture. Uh, so what is your, how do you think blockchain is going to fit into the future? Um, I know you, in your books, briefly talk about like micro capitalism sometimes, but, um, but you don't talk much on it. It might've just been like when the book came out. Uh, so well, it's kind of value communication is what I talk about rather than currency. So if you and I want to trade with each other. We want to have a transfer of a neutral value between us because you might have one thing that I want. I might not sell you something you want right now. Then we transfer some kind of value. That's what mm -hmm. currency does. Okay. That works pretty efficiently already with the national currencies we have. And because the national currencies are currently under a global deflationary pressure, this was a bad time to launch, launch cryptocurrencies and really think they would beat the share yeah. of the national currencies. Yeah. But if you do go into a period of, say, high inflation, because the governments are bankrupt and they start printing tons of money and suddenly have an inflationary pressure on the economy, then certainly jump to the cryptocurrencies in no time at all. Mm -hmm. So that can happen and probably will happen. And the countries where cryptocurrency is happening are the ones where you don't have a currency that works. So like Venezuela. probably in Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Yeah. But blockchains in general are way more interesting than that. I'll tell you which is the first city in Europe where people are actually using blockchains for contracts on property. It's Kiev in the Ukraine. Oh, really? Why do you think it's in Kiev? Because Ukraine is so damn corrupt. You cannot trust anybody. So if you think you're buying a property, somebody else can come in with a gun the next day, put the gun to your head and say, you have to give them the property you just purchased. So you can't have a property market on there unless you have blockchain. Because what blockchain beautifully does is that it locks in history at a specific point in time that cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. And I think specifically in cultures where people want to be honest, but the culture is so damn corrupt, but you've got Wi-Fi, you've got technology available. Those cultures like Ukraine, certain parts of Africa, certain parts of India, are the ones where you're going to see blockchain really change society rapidly. And what you do is that you basically create chains of trust that are amazing because you're now in technology where you can make thousands of strangers trust each other. That's the hardest challenge we ever had before. 
Making you trust somebody outside of your own family, outside of your own tribe, was always the hardest thing we could imagine for people to do. And now suddenly we can have 56 year old ladies sitting in Sweden, trading directly with guys in China, trusting them because of damn blockchains. That's the real revolution of blockchain. It's the verification that somebody's spoken the truth at a certain point in time, and that truth holds. I think we, I, I often write about it, that we are limiting the way that we're thinking about blockchain, and it definitely doesn't only have to be value transfer, it could also just be any kind of like, uh, anything you want to be permanent, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think cryptocurrencies are right, because the first guys jump onto new technologies, and I love them for it, all the little <laughs> So, so yeah. I don't want freedom. I don't want a government to rule me. I want to decide everything for myself. Okay. Libertarians are therefore great innovators. So they jumped onto this and what they saw was, of course, that I can create my own damn bank and I can basically, you know, run the international banking system down on its knees. And to a certain extent, that's exactly what has happened. Now the banks are doing all they can to go after the cryptocurrencies. Even in China, they closed down, they closed mm-hmm. down Bitcoin and things like that. So mining has been closed down to least temporarily. And they should go after because these new currencies are difficult to control and obviously that means you and i can trade without government involvement Mm -hmm. okay of course they create huge black markets drug trades there you know sex trade whatever people want to do the governments don't let you do people can do directly in between each other but that's only bound to happen and then the rest is a a bit of a cat and mouse game so I'm interested in what libertarians can do. I love anarchists. I think they're, they're causing good havoc on society. Mm-hmm. And governments and states and things have to reorganize themselves and be much more honest in their proceedings. And if they're going to print, they will have their own cryptocurrencies distributed by the banks. They better shape up their business to begin with and be more trustworthy. Mm-hmm. Again, the algorithms will point you in that direction. The algorithm will answer which one of these currencies is available to me where I can transfer a value between me and my friend. Should I go to? The algorithm will say, this one is the currency you can trust the most. Mm-hmm. Now you want to have another currency with lower transfer fees, slightly more risk, this is the one. So these kind of currencies are going to top the algorithm charts in the next two to three years. You're going to see type of rapidly. And I'm not sure it's going to be the dollar or the euro. Mm-hmm. It could very well be some other currency. But at the end of the day, the really interesting thing in blockchain is to understand trade. And what we're studying now in our work, we're studying the big trade routes throughout history, the Silk Route, to understand culture. The, the, the big trade routes are the most magnificent thing humanity ever created. Yeah. They really yeah. are. They're stunning. Yeah, different cultures. If it wasn't for pandemics, they'd only been good, right? So along the trade routes where we actually have created enormous value, transferred it and traded with each other and connected the cultures with each other. So if you're going to go into, say, an age where we also have to be cosmopolitans now, we have to love the stranger, we have to go towards some kind of global order where, you know, if you love strangers more than other guys do, it should be beneficial too, right? So you want to create a cosmopolitanism in response to everything else that's going on out there, then I think the blockchains are the best damn machines we can have, the best damn technology we can have to support us. Uh, 100%. So this also brings me to my next question. So a lot of blockchain, crypto, Twitter, overlaps with like the accelerationist uh, crowd. Um, so, and it's like, so accelerationism um, is about, you know, like pushing forward as opposed to like the conservation of, like modern society or what have you and try to like make it as more possible um but uh do you what do you think about accelerationism do you uh and yeah and what are your thoughts on that matter i'm an old friend of nick lance and he's one of the brightest philosophers of my generation but the last thing i heard of him he was sitting in shanghai with eight books he hasn't finished yet <laughs> and some the roses okay guy's brilliant he also read the last when he was younger just like me this is one of those favorite guys i have another guy i've got my eyes on is he's, he's, he's a mad guy no, he's not mad. He's mad in a beautiful way. Called Jason Reza Jordan, an Iranian American who I admire deeply. He's rewriting Asia's history at the moment. And he's doing it beautifully. These guys were all Deleuzians. They read Deleuze in the 1980s and 1970s, mm-hmm. and that was the French philosopher. Really, is the way forward. So, so there's tons of stuff going on there. But the accelerationists, they can be fun and interesting, but they fundamentally are wrong on two things. One of them is that they're too obsessed with the eschatology. I'm actually obsessed with the opposite of that called eventology. Okay, I love know? events. I love emergences. 
I don't believe in Ray Kurzweil's stupid singularity. I think something much more profound is going to happen and something more interesting than his little boy's dream about a singularity. It's very, it's very like, uh, drenched in like Christian mythology. Yeah, and he's like a kid, you know, fantasizing what it's like to have his father's penis, although it doesn't happen. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's not, the, don't trust the guy who doesn't have anything sexual about what he's pursuing, right? That's always scary. <laughs> Stay away with those guys. Stay with the handsome guys you get laid. They're more trustworthy. Trust me. Yeah, but emergence is amazing. Emergence is the difference between physics and chemistry. Emergence is the difference between chemistry and biology. We need to understand emergence is better. We need to understand why something is bigger than, than its parts and not just say it. We need to understand what that means. What is the added, sudden added complexity that creates a whole new habit of nature within which something new can thrive. Our own consciousness is in that sense an emergence. And biology and life itself is in that sense an emergence. Mm -hmm. So each emergence has to be understood as its own vector. But they're all connected. I'm a radical monist. We live in one universe where everything is connected with anything else. And if you don't understand that, just understand gravity. Everything affects everything else. And that issue is set. But within the different emergence vectors, different habits or laws or rules operate. Mm -hmm. So to understand biology, you need to become a damn biologist. It doesn't operate like physics. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you've understood this with emergence, you understood the beauty that something can suddenly just happen from out of nowhere. The name for that in the world of philosophy is the event. So an eventology is a worldview that is obsessed with events. When will the next amazing unexpected thing happen? And what kind of effect will that have? And are we prepared for it? That is the opposite of eschatology. Eschatology is obsessed with implosions. When will this go down? When will the United States be destroyed? When will China fall apart? When will you die? Whatever you like, right? Mm -hmm. So eschatology to me is just a negative mindset. It's kind of boring. And the problem with accelerationism is that it moves towards an eschatology. And then somehow, once the eschatology has happened, heaven will suddenly just arrive. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing does not follow from the next. The problem is historically that once you have an eschatology like the First World War, it's very likely that an even worse one called the Second World War will pop up 20 years later. Mm -hmm. If you learn from history, no, 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 no. Just an instructive way downward. No, the little boy saw the dream that if just hell breaks loose, the post-apocalypse world will be beautiful. Unfortunately, it's usually the other way around. And these guys are way too dependent on chance. Mm -hmm. If we just accelerate this nasty stuff here, then suddenly the good stuff will happen. No connection between the two. Mm -hmm. So I find accelerationism interesting as an idea. I like to people to play around with the left and the right and politics. And I'm a Marxist libertarian myself, so there you go. But I am not a part of a movement that wants the world to go down, and then out of that, something better will happen because I'm not sure this is going to happen at all. Yeah, if, we're, if, we're, if it goes down, we might not even be here. So it's like, why, why even go down that path again? So watch out with your own subconsciousness and look at yourself when you're watching movies and TV series and things that are you too much into the eschatologies of the world or are you more into the eventologies of the world? Mm -hmm. They're opposites. I'm an eventologist myself. Very cool. Um, so that also kind of brings me to the other thing that I, the other book that I cannot stop thinking about since I read it this year, uh, Digital Libido, um, and like the dialect is between like mortito and libido, and and I kind of see now I can't look at something and not see a libidinal versus a mortidinal like mindset yeah. involved in it or inner circle, outer circle, like that's all I've been obsessed with. So can you speak a little bit on your ideas there? Um, and yeah, what's the first thing you want when you're born? Uh, your, the mom's the breast. You want the milk. Well, you do crawl to it. You only crawl to it because you can't have what you want. And that's to get back in. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. It's called heterosexuality when you're 18 years old. <laughs> so you want to get back in. You want to die. You don't want to exist as an independent, autonomous entity separated from your mother's body. That scares the shit out of you. This is the birth of Mortido. So we, we claim that this is basic. And we agree with Freud here. He calls it the death drive. The problem is the contemporary society is then full of people who live immersed in this when they grow older because the one thing that should happen to you when you cannot get back in is that you will deny that you want to get back in. You crawl up the breast, you start sucking it, 
and that's the the birth of libido. Mm. Libido is that within you that wants to live. Motivo is that within you that wants to die. What we call this book Digital Libido is we then trace what it is within us as human beings that does want to live. And even if it's a denial process originally, it works and we should stay with it our entire lives. And I can assure you this one thing. If you want to get enlightened and you want to go extinguished and you don't want to exist any longer and stop existing and suffering or whatever you want to do, that will happen to you anyway. It's called death. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, it will happen. So I'm a Zoroastrian rather than a Buddhist, right? So I'm a Zoroastrian in the sense that I think it's great that we have a libido and we should actually use it our entire lives. And libido is the reason why we want to get up in the morning and go to work and have kids and have a life and find partners and do art and do amazing stuff and then have a live the full life of our own people, then we're ready to die. Mm-hmm. That's whole idea, moving towards some kind of a wholeness before you die. And if you're lucky having had a full life and a whole life, is the meaning of being human. So that means libido is absolutely essential to me. Unfortunately, our contemporary society is full of mortido everywhere. It's full of what Nietzsche regretted and said, the slave mentality. It's just seeking submission all the time. Why? Because it's more comfortable and less energy consuming. For sure. Why can't well, I just find somebody whose ass I can lick so I don't have to make any decisions myself? Mm-hmm. And out of a lack of self-confidence, many people end up there too. Yeah, I, we're seeing a lot of that right now with like the environmental movement. Um, and every other article every day is like, you know, we're pushing towards eating crickets and like stop using stuff and just do less and less and less until you live in a pod and it's, 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 it's rough. Well, I'm strongly opposed to it, not because I'm opposed to, you know, I understand climate change is happening and the climate deniers are wrong. But what we're doing here in Sweden, we're working on a new model. We're going to split up the environmentalist movement, which is long overdue because it's too dogmatic today. And I'd call these two movements eco-moralism and ecotopianism. Okay. Eco-moralism is where environmentalism has ended up today. It's just blaming you for existing in the first place. Like if, if you just died, somehow the world would be better. Well, there'd be nobody here to enjoy it, so what would be the point? Okay? Mm-hmm. But eco-moralists are so cynical now, and they love their motito so much, they just want people to go away because people are evil. And it's just about everything else out there is good and people are evil. It's an incredibly sort of nasty, fairy tale version of the world. It's blatantly untrue. The ecotopians, though, are guys who are interested in architecture and engineering to solve these problems and go straight to the problem solution. That means you're going to see the ecotopians in the 2020s probably be strong opponents of nuclear power, strong opponents of genetically modified food. And they're going to love pissing off their mums who invested their entire lives in eating organic food. That's actually destructive to the climate because organic food takes more land to grow than genetically modified food. You need pesticides to grow organic food. You don't need pesticides to grow genetically modified food because it is genetically modified precisely not to have to use pesticides. Mm -hmm. So, and at the end of the day, any technological solution we can have that sort of puts a break on climate change would be great. Then we can pursue how can we create, for example, sustainable, cheap energy in huge amounts, because then we can solve all the other problems of humanity. How can we desalinate water on a massive scale? These are the real problems of people around the world today. Mm-hmm. If you can only make it slightly cheaper, more efficient to desalinate water, that solves a lot of problems for people. If you can get rid of malaria, that solves a lot of problems for people. This requires technological changes, and the name for this fantasy is ecotopianism. The name for that planet is ecotopia. Mm-hmm. It's a completely cultivated planet where the whole planet has been turned into some kind of a garden of Babel. And there's not a single corner on the planet that isn't covered with sensors, so we know what's going on. We can make informed decisions about what we need to do to save ourselves from climate change. Yeah, this is a very positive like, view of the future. It's because um, someone tweeted yesterday, I can't remember exactly who, uh, like right now it's so much talk, about, more cinematic talk, but then why don't we just put out more books on material science? Why don't we, for every time we have a kid crying about the environment, why don't we just give them books on like, an, uh, what's the uh, uh, atmospheric chemistry or like why, why are we not actually providing solutions and only crying about the end of the world? Well, it's just moralism. Now, the funny thing is this. It was my students here in Stockholm who created the Greta Thunberg phenomenon. Oh, really? And then I became like her nasty uncle on Twitter going after her, right? Because she, she's just a 60-year-old girl. And this 
easy, simple moralism. If she dared to talk about nuclear power, for example, I would really admire her, but she won't. Now she goes to the UN and yells at her parents. Well, that's easy for any 60 year old to do. It doesn't really provide us with the solutions from you either, Greta. You know? So at the end of the day, I don't think these naive solutions about moralism and about us being nasty people and if only we're good people, solve these problems. That's just children's fairy tales. It's not gonna solve the major problems. We're gonna have huge costs due to climate change. But I would compare that to possible third world war, which would be way costier. So I would say the real threat against humanity today is still nuclear power and nuclear, the nuclear weapons being spread. Mm. And, and, and if nuclear weapons spread around the world, that's a major hassle for us to deal with because I, nuclear devastation, that would beat the shit out of climate change, to be honest about it. People really do underestimate the, like, what 3D printers plus like a library and you know, some raw materials can do. Exactly. So you got a drone, you got a 3D printer, and you got a bomb recipe bought in Pakistan or somewhere, and you got a little terror sack and they got a nuclear bomb within the next 10 years. That's mm -hmm. a very realistic scenario. That scares the shit out of me way more than climate change. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but it does. Climate change will happen anyway. It's going to be costly and messy, yes. The question is, can we put a break on it so it's less dramatic? That would be a good thing. But at the end of the day, how do we create a planet called Ecotopia on which we can live and become true cosmopolitans? Mm -hmm. That's why we must arrive at philosophy. All the philosophers of my generation agree that this is the overall goal. This is the vision. The right. phallic vision we need to stick to now. I agree. So back to the, uh, your book. Uh, so you were talking about libido and mortido and then, so now I kind of see everything as like this dialectic, it's kind of that you brought out. So where do you feel like a lot of like the libidinal energy society right now is coming from? Um, there's a huge, especially in crypto Twitter, there's a huge um, wave of people interested in like Bronze Age pervert. Uh, and because he brings like the, in American politics, he's like the only like libidinal, like it's like it's mostly just an ebook, but like it's the only place to get anything of that nature from. Um, so what do you, where do you see it come from? These days? I see the meme plexus. I see the new ideas popping up in the 2020s and they're going to spread like wildfire because they're going to be funny. They're going to be transparent and honest in their search. Uh, meanwhile, I see a lot of havoc coming. I, I think we've only seen the beginning of the conflict between the alt-right and the alt-left in America. And they're equally really? bad because they're both based on a saw and resentment. Mm -hmm. I think the social justice warriors are, are, are doing themselves more damage than anybody else, but the alt-right are doing exactly the same thing. Basically, the, the alt-left said, everything is the white heterosexual man's fault. We're all victims because of him. There was only a question of time before the white heterosexual man stepped up and said, no, I take opioids and I'm a fucking loser. I'm the victim. And that's the alt-right. Now, okay. They want to dominate the arena to themselves. They want to keep the arena to themselves. They love each other to bits because if they can keep everybody else out, they basically rule the game. Mm -hmm. That's going to cause a lot of havoc. So we need to respond to both and say, no, you're both wrong. And we recognize your so and heritage where you come from. And the resentment calls you both presenting you're equally wrong. And we need none of it. It doesn't help any one of us. We need heroic stories about men and women who go forward and are heroic in their approach or heroic tribes, heroic subcultures that believe in their own capacity for creativity and co-creation and show others how you can do that. We need those stories. And I think those guys have the self-confidence and are doing those things are also the ones that are gonna have a sense of humor and some irony to play around with the other guys' mistakes. I certainly mm -hmm. hope so for the next 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that I definitely kind of agree with that. With the 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 real difference between this evil case compared to other things was the I, the humor in it. Uh, yeah, it didn't... But expect the alt right to be around. Expect the alt left to be around, and also expect a lot of really sick and weird sects and cults. Because oh, what yeah. happens now, we don't have real phallic leadership. We don't have the chieftains out there to lead us. That means the perverted priests are set to take over and the perverted priests will create all kinds of weird sects and cults. We're going to see tons of them, loads of weirder and stranger sects and cults all the time. And people are just going to jump into these cults because they have nowhere else to go, and no identity, and that's the only subculture they can belong to and they're going to stay with these sects and cults. So there's going to be quite a lot of that the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, that's been popping up a lot. Uh, the especially with like Epstein issue with the and like the I can never pronounce like the the 
corporate mar multi-marketing spectacle uh, yeah. and a lot of Hollywood stuff. It's, it's becoming a whole. It's, it's funny how it used to just be conspiracy, but now it's like, no, we know pretty definitively now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, and then also, um, I, from my own personal curiosity, uh, wanted to like talk more, hear more, hear you talk more about like exploitation. Um, that was always yeah. a con it makes sense, um, but that was always the topic in your book that I was, I always wanted to like know far more about. Uh, so can you speak to that a bit? Well, implantation is tied to tensionalism, so it's a new term we need to understand how you actually make something meaningful and valuable to you. We are trained to think only in terms of exploitation. Mm -hmm. Exploitation works like this. I put the resource in front of you, and you're supposed to automatically associate these resources with how you can exploit it and use it to your own advantage, and then exploit it maximally. That's called capitalism. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now... Maybe I've got something in front of me that is a shared resource that others could actually benefit from as well. And I decide to, no, I'm not going to exploit this. I'm going to keep it as it is and see what I can do with it instead. Something more meaningful than exploitation. Number one, it should be sustainable. So it should be around. It should not be plundered or exploited or, or used. It should rather be kept in a way. It's energy or flows within it should be kept. It's more sustainable. And I can create something, some kind of value out of that because of that. And we didn't have a word for it until we came up with this word 20 years ago called imploitation, which is, of course, the exact opposite of exploitation. Instead of exploiting me, why don't you imploit me? Meaning that why don't you keep me and strengthen me and then have access to me and have me as a value? So there's a shared value coming out of that. The perfect example of that is a relationship of love. Mm -hmm. If you exploit another human being, you're basically plundering them. That's what trafficking and slavery is. But if you meet another human being, you start having a relationship with that person, you both grow in the process. You have an expansive you know, effect on each other. And low make, love makes you do that. So say you're a parent and a child. There certainly should be the relationship you have between a parent and a child, but also between two partners who decide to live together. If these are exploitative, not exploitative relationships. They're exploitative. They push more value into the other person and thereby something more comes out of it. So instead of just, you know, building a huge hotel in an airport or a little island in the Caribbean, maybe you should just keep it as it is and invite people to come along and then create amazing things and, and create art of it that they can then send around the world. You don't, you don't sit and calculate how you're going to make money out of something when you employ something. Mm -hmm. You decide not to do that. You decide not to exploit. But instead, you, you decide to keep the value as it is, keep it sustainable, and then expect something more meaningful to come out of that just through pure exploitation. So this brings, more, brings it back more to like the event uh, yeah. conversion phenomena from by night. So, for example, a lot of guys now want to do social entrepreneurship. It mm -hmm. sounds like a good thing to do. I tell them, okay, it's really hard to run a company with a profit to begin with, so why don't you start there? Then you're going to have to create some other additional value on top of that if you're going to call it social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Why don't you look into the principle of exploitation instead? So then you can look at what do you have? What are your assets? And how can you use these assets to something more meaningful that's more meaningful to you? Yes, you will make less money out of it, but not only will you make less money out of it and create some kind of social value out of it, you will also stop thinking of it as something you're exploiting. Mm -hmm. So the value will last over a long period of time. And it's precisely when you start looking at something along the time axis, not like a limited resource that you exploit and then it's empty and gone. Because that's what we did when the little boy fire was ruled the world. It was called colonialism, you know, and capitalism. No, we can't do that any longer. If you're going to have a sustainable planet, you've got to rethink what is a resource and what can we use it for. And this is the exploitative mindset. And it's going to beat the exploitative mindset because it lasts so much longer. That's interesting. Um, very cool. Uh, and then lastly, um, the, my, I've noticed recently a lot, like the shift from people from Facebook to Instagram to Twitter, and now I'm seeing people move to like Discord and Telegram. Um, do you think, uh, that, or are I don't, I'm trying to phrase this question. Do you think that there's going to be like a, an exodus, I guess, from like these more public uh, social media platforms to like um, to kind of retreat into like I remember in the book it called like the Metacratic Pyramid um, I don't know yeah what are your thoughts on this like 
Uh, mm -hmm. Facebook never understood people. I mean, couldn't they make an effort to open a customer service? They had all those billions of dollars, you know, so somebody could answer the phone if they, you were treated badly on Facebook. No, the algorithms basically banged you on your head and, and threw you out for 30 days. You didn't know why. Mm -hmm. Treating people that way is so fucking shitty, they deserve this current crisis. Mm -hmm. So Facebook have lost about, what, one and a half million Americans per month right now leaving Facebook. And can we blame them? You open Facebook in the morning, you get 75 different events thrown at you. Mm -hmm. What do you think I'm going to sit here all day and look through these events and decide what I'm going to do? Why don't you tell me what I want? Or at least give me maximum three, which is, you know, comprehensible. So the value we get out of the Facebook experience has deteriorated so quickly. And only the losers and the trolls are still there. Mm -hmm. So why would I go there to find out anything that has value to me? You know, you still do the emails at least if you're professional and you work with people and you go to the chat channels and they're getting better and better all the time. And what saves Facebook as a company is of course, they own WhatsApp and Instagram. Mm -hmm. I hope they certainly don't want Facebook to decide over WhatsApp and Instagram because right now WhatsApp and Instagram are way better than Facebook is, right? So people are just going to move. They're going to take their friends with them and go to discourse and other places where they feel better respected and get better value out of their time spent. Mm -hmm. This is essentialism. It's not the money spent it's the time spent that we appreciate and we're constantly rethinking why am i here now we've learned that a new tech platform it can be really you know hyped and whatever but if my friends aren't there and if i don't communicate with them and if i don't get a better value in my life out of this experience why would i stay mm -hmm. that's what we're discovering network effect is critical so I, th I, think, I think it's a good competition between these different platforms to see who actually provides us with the value. And one thing I know for sure is that any new platform being launched in 2019 that asks me who my friends are and I have to add hundreds of people, I hate it from day one. If they can't even figure out who I know and I have to tell them, they're so fucking stupid they deserve sort of to die, you know? I mean, at least it has to be intelligent for God's sake. It has to meet me and meet you and create shared, stronger values that we can share. All of this is network dynamics. Network dynamics works according to the ethical principle of collaboration because we love it because we're human. And if the collaboration leads to higher value and you feel you've expanded, and I feel that I expanded in the process, we're gonna return to each other and we're gonna do it all over again. Mm -hmm. That's a very simple principle for network dynamics. And we can tie it to the machines around us and the people around us and the networks around us and subcultures around us and nightclubs we go to and partners we sleep with or whatever. But if we don't get a network dynamical value out of the relations we have, we will move on and try something different. Mm -hmm. Very true. Uh, do you have any, uh, anything about your new book or any new projects that, in the work that you'd like to tell the audience? Well, I'm not going to talk about books I haven't written yet. It's going to take us three to four years to write the next book, but we're going to deliver the synopsis here in October. Okay. It is, of course, the third installment of the trilogy where synthism and digital libido are the first two parts. Mm -hmm. So first, synthism declares religion, metaphysics, absolutely possible. And if we need to build the God or the Messiah for that matter to save us, this is how we must do. Uh, then comes digital libido. The next 50 years, havoc misunderstandings, people do not understand what the internet is, they be very confused when it comes and hits them on the head all the time, and it's going to be very messy with sex and cults and bombs and terror and all kinds of things, very, very possibly so. Mm -hmm. So that's the warning. The third book then obviously moves into the more messianic, that's all we're going to say, but what kind of exodus is it that the really smart, clever guys out there who do understand what the internet is about? Where will they want to live and who do they want to socialize with? Where do they want to pay their taxes? Where do they want to send their kids to school? And in the cosmopolitan world, what we see ahead of us is that we're going to have some smart city states to pick up on, this, on these needs. And they're going to pull ahead of the rest of the world dramatically. I actually don't believe that much in the big empires like America and China. I think they're going to have big problems as we go forward. I think small entities, I work in countries like Estonia and Slovenia, and, and you know, the smaller countries and city-states like Singapore and Dubai are way better off than these big old empires with their internal conflicts and problems they need to sort out. Mm. And by the way, if you need a lot of soldiers to run a big army, why don't you just get some damn drones and throw the soldiers out? And then Singapore can easily have a bigger army than China. Game over. Very true. 
it's, it's funny because actually a lot of the crypto people talk about moving to Singapore or moving to Seychelles or whatever. Conference. I told you, these I love these guys because they're libertarians. They're certainly necrotic. They're going to be head of the game. And the fact that they're thinking about where they want to live and where they want to move and have a nomadic mindset in that process is very, very healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, the smart guys that I follow out there, they're moving and they're moving quite often these days. And they take everything they have with them. They don't mind. They're going back to a nomadic state, except now they're moving from different cities around the world, meeting new friends, making new friends everywhere. And, and these strong social networks these guys are creating, they're going to rule the world. They're going to rule sure. the world. These are the netocrats. Yes. Awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you talking uh, with us. Uh, thank you for taking your time out. Um, I'm gonna love you guys. Keep the great work you're doing. See if I can come back on again whenever you think I'm ready for it. And <laughs> let's keep on having a great conversation. Definitely. I'll make sure to link all your books in the description. Sure. I'll use my social media too. There you go. Have a nice evening. Oh yeah.